Merci beaucoup. When Prime Minister Justin Trudeau finished outlining Canada's peacekeeping pledge, he received a standing ovation. In one country, we might... Later, he faced plenty of questions about how this plan aligns with the government's earlier promise to deploy 600 troops and 150 police officers. Canada is looking to have an impact beyond... Uh, the simple sending of uh, troops, which we will do. Instead of deploying to a specific mission, officials say the government will work with the UN to figure out what help is needed where. What this does uh, is leverage uh, the unique uh, skills of uh, a country that has one of the best militaries in the world to try and affect more than just that one spot that 600 people would affect. Canada is offering training and equipment like aircraft to the UN, which could be used by countries that have troops deployed to dangerous peacekeeping missions. Bangladesh has about 8,000 peacekeepers all over the world, and Lieutenant General Rahman says one of their biggest needs is medical uh, support. Equipments, new equipment uh, from other countries, uh, at the field hospital from other countries, and then uh, going to the mission area, these are going to help to a great extent. Another key part of the plan is to invest in getting more women into peacekeeping. Of the nearly 110,000 UN peacekeepers currently deployed around the world, just over 4% of them are women. In 2015, the UN set a goal to double that number, but it's barely moved. And officials acknowledge that's a problem. We know that um, women peacekeepers make peacekeeping more effective. They can talk um, to women and children, and they can therefore also um, uh, contribute a lot um, to protection of the civilian uh, population. Canada is starting a $15 million fund which countries can tap into to recruit more women. Officials are encouraging other countries to invest too, so that forces on the ground better represent the people that they're trying to protect. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, you heard Breyer mention, as of last month, there were 107,000 peacekeepers deployed worldwide. Canada's contribution? 62. The biggest contributor to UN peacekeeping right now is Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and India round out the top three. And as for where they're going, most UN peacekeepers are deployed across Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Darfur, Mali, and the Central African Republic. It has been 21 years since the UN first promised to address sexual abuse by UN peacekeepers and to increase the number of women deployed in operations. Yet, the exploitation of defenseless civilians still takes place, and still less than 4% of all peacekeepers are women. Angelina Jolie was in Vancouver today and gave the keynote address at the peacekeeping conference. She's urging the United Nations to renew its efforts to stop sexual violence in war, and she thanked the Canadian government for its leadership on women, peace, and security. Now, Jolie's praise aside, Canada has been criticized for lagging behind on peacekeeping, and today it responded with a new plan, but new missions were not a part of it. So. It's not clear if it'll be enough to convince the world to give Canada a seat on the UN Security Council. And that could be an uphill battle, considering how far away Canada is from its peacekeeping heyday. How can we get from them the support and cooperation which is required? It all started with Lester B. Pearson, considered the father of international peacekeeping. He proposed the first official force, even won a Nobel Peace Prize for it back in 1957. All of that before becoming Canada's Prime Minister. An airlift of a thousand Canadian troops to a Mediterranean hotspot, Cyprus. And pretty soon, this country's blue berets were being sent to places all over the world, like Congo and Cyprus. And the notion that we, as a nation, were keeping worldwide peace became sewn into the fabric of our national identity. All out, the officers! But over time, things changed, and pretty dramatically in the 1990s. Peacekeeping became tainted. Canadian soldiers in Somalia were accused of torture and murder. They stood helpless, bearing witness to atrocities of the most savage kind in Rwanda, and they came back broken. And there were these demoralizing moments, as one of Canada's own was taken hostage in Bosnia. So by the early 2000s, things changed. Canada scaled back its peacekeeping contributions 
opting for military aid instead. Now, that difference is not a small one. Violence used to be a last resort in peacekeeping, but that's not often the case anymore. Earlier today, I talked to someone who has firsthand experience with that change, an army reservist and a former peacekeeper in Bosnia. And I wanted to hear where he thinks Canadian peacekeeping is going in the modern era. Have a listen. What do you think Canadians think of when they think about peacekeeping? I think most Canadians have a bit of a, a dated um, rose-colored glass version of what is peacekeeping from the 1950s, the era of Lester Pearson, and when peacekeeping was between two warring nations with a, an agreement in place and blue berets were stuck in the middle of them to guarantee that peace where no fighting would carry on. And how's peacekeeping changed? Those conflicts became messier, bloodier? Definitely. Much more aggressive, much more violent. Uh, and much more complicated to deal with because it was simply wasn't dealing with uh, the, due, the due representative of a nation state to potentially find a, a peaceful resolution. When you look at what the government has announced today, do you feel like that upholds the legacy of what Canada has, has spent decades building? I don't think it lets the legacy down in any way. I think it's providing unique capabilities that in many cases are missing from uh, modern peace support operations. A lot of the, the boots on the ground are provided by developing nations in a lot of cases. Um, what those developing nations uh, have lots of in many cases are soldiers. What they often lack is technological capability or the ability to uh, do transport over a wide area, provide communications, intelligence, uh, detailed comprehensive training. Uh, these are all skills that Canada can bring to bear. But, but I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, is, is there not a sense, even at least internationally, that, that, that Canada has, has lost some of the prestige or, or, or the importance on the international scene that, that perhaps it once held? I mean, if you look back several decades. Um, I personally don't take that view. Realistically, we are engaged around the world. We may not be engaged wearing a blue beret and peace peace support operations working directly under a UN mandate, but ultimately we are engaged in, in operations with a larger intent of peace and stability around the world. So whether it's wearing a balloon beret or it's whether it's under a NATO mandate, in my opinion, is, is almost uh, splitting hairs.